realigning some of the, the traditional roles of all these major comment powers. on the 12 points of the Chinese government's peace plan for Ukraine. Oh, the 12 point. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Perfect. Okay. So why don't we just, if you don't mind, take a pause for seven or eight minutes on Ukraine, just to give you my own sense of what's happening, uh, which is actually close to John Mearsheimer in certain ways. And I've seen a lot of this uh, firsthand. Basically, uh, the idea that this is a provoked war is an idea that the United States uh, acted in a way which Russian leaders understandably viewed as deeply threatening Russia's security. I believe that to be the case. And that goes back 30 years now. And so let me explain briefly. Gorbachev was a, a miracle for the world because he believed in unilaterally disbanding the Warsaw Pact military alliance of the Soviet Union and making a peace between the Soviet Union and the West, and the West meaning the United States and Europe, basically. And this was a dream unimaginable, really, that this could happen. But it did happen. And I attribute a great deal of it to uh, not even to Russia's or the Soviet Union's weakness, though that was undoubted, and need for reform, but actually to the extraordinary decency of this leader and the search for a, a way uh, forward peacefully. At the time that Gorbachev made this move, the United States and Germany, especially Germany because it was interested in German reunification, made very clear that the West would not take advantage of the Soviets' unilateral action by expanding the US military alliance eastward. This is not a myth. This is hard facts. And you can find this on uh, the uh, George Washington University archives, uh, what Gorbachev heard. You can find that online if you and all of the underlying documentation. And if you can't find it, email me and I will give you the, the links. I know this from 30 years ago. And the US had a different view. The US starting in 1992 took the view that now we were in a US led world, a unipolar world, and that the US could do what it wanted. And it aimed to do what it wanted. The authors of this were in both political parties, in the Republican Party, especially Cheney, Wolfowitz, Rumsfeld, in the Democratic Party, Hillary Clinton, uh, Victoria Nuland, President Biden, and others. This is a doctrine which is rightly called neoconservatism, but it's a doctrine of US exceptionalism and unipolarity, that the US aim is dominance, what they call full spectrum dominance, meaning military, technological, and economic dominance of the United States in every major region of the world. In the mid-1990s, there was a huge fight inside the US government between those who said, don't expand NATO, you will wreck relations with Russia, and those who said, we're the United States, we do what we want. In the end, Clinton went with the we do what we want school of thought. And the first NATO expansion took place, uh, expanding to Poland, the Czech Republic, and uh, Hungary. That raised tensions with Russia. And the greatest statesman of and scholar of 
U.S. Russian relations in our modern history, George Kennan, said this will lead to a new Cold War, declaring that in 1997. The Secretary of Defense at the time, Bill Perry, thought about resigning in protest. He was so upset with the decision to expand NATO because he regarded it as a basic violation of promises as well as a basic provocation to Russia. Now, I can tell you that first expansion was taken badly, but it did not lead to this war. The next step was 1999. For a variety of reasons, NATO bombed Serbia 48 straight days to break Serbia in two and to break Kosovo outside of Serbia. It was disgraceful, in my opinion. That was the first war in Europe since World War II, not the Ukraine war. It was directed at Russia's close ally, and it was directed at regime change, period, and to break Serbia. That raised the temperature a little bit higher. Then came 9-11, and President Putin immediately said to the United States, I will help you, we will cooperate together. But then came two terrible decisions. First, the United States unilaterally walked out of the anti-ballistic missile treaty in 2002. This was taken as a direct an immediate threat to Russia because it meant the possibility of the United States looking for a first strike potential against Russia. It was a unilateral action by one of our worst governments in our modern history. I keep saying that they keep getting worse. So, uh, but at the time I thought this is pretty bad, uh, George W. Bush Jr. Then in 2003 came the completely unprovoked Iraq war on completely false pretenses, cooked up phony intelligence to launch a war of regime change again. That raised temperatures further. <laughs> then in 2004, the United States expanded NATO seven times to Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, Romania, Bulgaria, Slovakia, and Slovenia. If you look at a map, it's like the water rising. ABM treaty, bombing Serbia, NATO expansion to the Black Sea, to the Baltics. Temperatures are getting very high. And in the 2007 Munich Security Summit, Putin said, stop, you are threatening our core security, stop. So what did the United States do? In 2008, it said, we will expand NATO to Ukraine and to Georgia. Take a look at the map to understand what this is about. The goal is to surround Russia in the Black Sea. This is an explicit understanding because then you have Ukraine, Romania, Bulgaria, Turkey, Georgia, completely surrounding the Russian fleet in Sevastopol. That's the goal. Then Russia is unable to project any power in the Eastern Mediterranean or the Middle East. Putin told Bush in Bucharest in 2008, you do this, you will find out this is absolutely our red line. Don't do this. At the time, European leaders spoke to me, said, what is your president doing? This is completely reckless. Of course, European leaders don't say this publicly, but they do say it to me because I'm friends with them, because I've known them for a long time. This is part of the lying that goes on. So 2008 was a watershed. Then came 2011. 
In 2011, President Obama instructed the CIA and other parts of the U.S. government to overthrow Bashar al-Assad in Syria. This was a U.S. regime change operation. The war broke out because of the United States arming a mercenary army together with Saudi Arabia to overthrow Assad. There would have been no war but for the United States. In 2012, the UN negotiated an end to the Syrian war. It was rejected by one country, the United States, because the US said, we insist on regime change as a predicate for ending this war. None of this you will find in the media because by now the media have stopped reporting almost any truths that are inconvenient. I know this firsthand from the highest authorities. Then in 2014, the United States helped to overthrow the Ukrainian government. Have no doubt about it. You can even listen to the tape of Victoria Nuland, who was then the Assistant Secretary of State, speaking to the U.S. Ambassador in Ukraine, Jeffrey Piat, about who's going to come into the government two weeks before the overthrow. I know firsthand about this. The United States helped to pay for the Maidan revolution, so-called, the protests, the demonstrations, and the violence that came, came from the Ukrainian side, not from the security forces of Yanukovych. This was a coup. You, this is important to understand because those are the first shots of the war a U.S. overthrow or a U.S. supported overthrow of the Ukrainian government. Now, what was Yanukovych doing that was so upsetting to the U.S.? He was pursuing neutrality. He was against NATO enlargement. And the U.S. overthrew him and a very Russophobic highly nationalist government came into power with the U.S. backing the next day, ended the neutrality, even passed a law outlawing the Russian language one day, though not implemented. But that was the beginning of the war. You, uh, the month after, uh, Russia retook Crimea. Many Russian forces in the Ukrainian military broke away from the military, took their equipment, and started the insurrection in Lugansk and Donetsk. These were Ukrainian weapons that came from contingents of the Ukrainian army. The fighting started in eastern Ukraine at that time. The United States sent billions of dollars of weapons to Ukraine during the period 2014 to 2021, building Ukraine's army and modernizing it, which is why it could fight as effectively as it did this past year. All of the fortifications, the cities turned into fortresses, the heavy, uh, heavy armaments, that was billions of dollars of US funding to arm an anti-Russian regime that it had helped bring to power. I think by now, Putin was a little annoyed, if I could put it that way. None of this history is recounted in our media, in our politics, in our discussion, because everything is that for an unprovoked reason, because Putin thinks he's Peter the Great, he launched a war for no other reason than imperial expansion on February 24th, 2022. 
that is a lie, ladies and gentlemen. This goes back 30 years, and the United States has behaved horribly because the U.S. should not move its military alliance to the more than 1,000 kilometer border of Russia. And this is the mistake. So at the end of 2021, President Putin put down three demands. One was neutrality. The second was Crimea remains part of Russia as Crimea has been the home to the Black Sea fleet since 1783. And the third is that the Minsk II agreement should be implemented as Europe and Ukraine had promised, but then reneged on. The United States refused to negotiate. I know it because I spoke to the White House then and said, what are you doing? This is the basis for peace. You can avoid this war. Just make clear NATO is not enlarging and the war will not happen. They would not do it because this has been a long standing project. Then they say this has nothing to do with NATO. If it has nothing to do with NATO, all the United States has to do tomorrow is to say NATO is not enlarging. Then we can test that theory versus my theory. But they won't say it. Why? Because they haven't thought about it? I don't think so because they have an intention to expand NATO. And that is the goal. And if it's not the goal, then they are so unbelievably irresponsible not to have tried the alternative that it is unimaginable. This is not to justify an invasion and the killing. It is to help you understand it. And most importantly, it is to help you to understand that there is a way for this war to end. That's the point. The way for this war to end, in my view, is President Biden picks up the phone and says, President Putin, NATO will not expand to Ukraine. Now let's talk. I may be wrong, but without trying that, I find it an egregious destruction of Ukraine, first and foremost, that's going on. I am not pro-Putin. I am pro-Ukraine. I want the killing to stop. I want us to try to end this war. I want us to understand the basic reason for this war, or if it's not the reason, to prove it. And this comes to your excellent question. Most of the world leaders I know around the world believe this is a war of NATO expansion. They believe this is a US-Russia proxy war. Maybe it's not, but then the United States has been the most failed diplomacy in the whole world. Because if really this is not right, all they have to do is say it. And the fact that they won't say it either shows a level of incomprehension and irresponsibility that is beyond my fathoming, or it shows a duplicity, which I believe to be the case. But on the substance, my view is that this neoconservative group has been in charge of US foreign policy since 1992. I think it has been an abject disaster for the United States. It has helped to create the war in Ukraine. It's bringing us absolutely to the risk of World War III in East Asia over Taiwan. Same kind of approach, same kind of provocations, shipping more arms to Taiwan, not respecting the one China policy, not having proper dialogue, all of it is utterly irresponsible. The world senses this now. So the United States and Europe 
did not isolate Russia at all. Russia trades with all of the rest of the world, with Africa, with Latin America, and with Asia. When you count the votes at the UN, if you count them by population, roughly 60 to 70% of the world always refuses to vote with the West. The West gets somewhere between 20 and 30% of the vote, most typically. This is a Western project, and it is a Western project either because of the most absurd failure of diplomacy or because they're not telling the truth. Either way, it's a failure of the West to put it this way. So if I'm completely wrong, they could easily prove this within one day. And they have not taken one single step to prove this approach, this hypothesis wrong. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.